secondary seeking of significant secondaries. Can everybody say that with me out loud now? Say that to your neighbor. The secondary seeking of significant secondaries. You've probably never heard that title before in your life. It's my conviction... It's my conviction that people are living lives today far below the level of their desires of their heart. It's my conviction that people are living today lives they actually don't want to live. They want to live a different life than they're living. They look at their life and say, this is the way it is. This is the way it's been. It seems like this is the way it's always going to be. But this is the life I desire. This is the life I'm longing for. This is the life I'm hungry. My conviction is that our many people are living lives that they don't even enjoy. And these are people we call Christians. These are people in our churches that are miserable, that are sad, that are upset, that are lonely, that are addicted, that are frustrated, that are angry, living beneath God's powerful design, brilliant design, wonderful creation for their life. <coughs> excuse me. They're living far beyond, excuse me, far below the design that God has for them, far below the calling that God has on their life, far below God's highest ex... Thank you so much. I got a little tickle in my throat just now. It was that title trying to say it. That's what got me. (laughs) Far below. I think people are living an unhealthy life, uh, uh, disconnected from friendships, struggling with their own families, far too complacent about the problems that they're facing, almost accepting them as if they're norms to be had and, and just tolerated and expected almost because, after all, God is God and He's not always about making us happy. How many of you had that wrong view of God, that God the Father is the mean one and Jesus Christ, His Son, was the nice one? And He had to come to earth and then tell His Father, don't be so mean, don't be so cruel, don't be so judgmental. That's not what it is. The Father God is as good as Jesus the Son is. The way that Jesus loves you is the way your Father God loves you. And we've gotten too much, it's my conviction, that many of us are complacent about our problems, tolerating, willing to live within our problems, thinking that God our Father is not concerned about our problems. He just wants us to toe the line and behave ourselves and make sure we keep the rules and the regulations and the laws and the, and the commands and, and don't enjoy life too much because then you might become worldly. Don't, don't, have, don't be happy as a Christian. There's a theological word for that. I don't always like to use big words, but this one, I just feel like I have to use this big theological word. I would say to that, baloney. <laughs> baloney, you are meant to be, you were created to be, it is God's longing in his heart for you to be happy, for you to be filled with joy, for you to be uh, thrilled when you wake up in the morning rather than pushing your snooze button seven to ten times because you don't want to get up out of bed because you don't want to face another day. I believe that Christians should not say, thank God it's Friday, but we should say, thank God it's Monday because you get to spend another week helping people, loving people, loving God, serving Jesus Christ, singing songs of praise, seeking his face, seeking his hand, moving in the spirit, living in the spirit. Thank God it's Monday. Thank God it's Tuesday. Thank God it's Wednesday. Thank God it's 6 a.m. Thank God it's 5.30 a.m. and your alarm clock went off. Thank God I'm getting up out of bed and I'm excited about life and I'm thrilled to serve the Lord and I love my wife after 40 years more than ever before, and I have four wonderful children, and five of the most, you may think this is competitive, and it might be, five of the most wonderful grandchildren you'll ever meet in your, in your life, and I am just thrilled, but so many of us, it's my contention, that we're disappointed, and we're discouraged, and we're depressed, and we're downcast, and we're distraught, and we're wondering, will life ever get any better. And that's why I believe for many of us, we go to work, maybe from, let's say your hours are from nine to five, you go to work, and then you come home, and you plop yourself down on your living room couch, and you turn the television on, and you watch television from six o'clock till you go to fall asleep at night while you have a bag of potato crisps in your hand. See how good I did that? I didn't call them potato chips, I called them potato crisps, because I'm culturally aware of things around me. (laughs) You have your potato crisps, and, 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 and you eat your uh, you know, your, your 
large bag of, of cookies and, uh, and you drink, you know, six or seven sodas and you sit there and you watch television and you laugh and you cry and you fall asleep and all the time your wife, you're ignoring your wife or your wife is ignoring the husband and the kids are on their computers or they're on their iPhone or iPad or i this or that and they're just they're they're playing video games for five six seven hours a day they this is the most addicted generation they're not just addicted to to drug uh, addictions now they're addicted to their phones uh, young people in this generation they actually have a name for them underneath the age of millennial do you know what they're called digital natives that's what sociologists have pegged this next generation of those, I think it's under 16, 17 years old, because their, their whole world is around uh, the digital. They are native to that kind of lifestyle. And, and so we plop ourselves down on the couch, remote in one hand, a bag of crisps in the other hand, a bag of chocolate chip cookies on the, on the, on the couch. And so many of us are so checked out of life, we don't even cook the chocolate chip cookies, we just eat the dough. And, but you don't know what I'm talking about. You must not live in America where, where you just buy a, a, a bag of cookie dough and just eat it right out of the thing raw. And, 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 and that's, that's how we're living our lives because we're unhappy. We're unfulfilled. We don't want to face life, so we're checking out of life. We're, we're checking out of life. We, 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 do, we'll ask the question, well, do I read my Bible? Yeah, I read my Bible. Do you pray? Yeah, I pray because I have to, because I'm supposed to. Where's the joy? Where's the life? Now, I believe that things I've just mentioned to you are serious problems facing the church and many Christians today, but I believe there's even a more serious problem is that, that we have all these problems and we're not worried that we have these problems. We have these problems and we're not concerned we have these problems. We have these troubles and we're not concerned, we're, we're not troubled that we're not troubled. We're accepting it as if it's the norm because we look around and we say, that's how every other Christian I met is like that, almost everybody. And so, and so I guess this is the norm. And that's why I believe that so many Christians never share their faith because they're unhappy and they don't want to make somebody else unhappy. Does that make sense to you? You're going to walk up to somebody that doesn't know Jesus, and you know Jesus, but you're unhappy, and you're dis- discouraged, and you're disappointed in life, and, and you're going to come up to somebody and say, hey, can I tell you how wonderful it is to serve Jesus? You can c- become disappointed too, just like me. <laughs> you can become discouraged. You can have a life where you hate Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You can lay on your couch like me every day and watch television and just check out of life. No wonder we're not witnessing because we're not loving our life that we have in Christ Jesus. You and I were meant to love the life we have in Jesus. Loving the life that we have in Jesus is our greatest joy. It, it is the greatest way to live our life. It is the most thrilling way to live. It is the most adventurous way to live. It is the most passionate way to live. It is the most exciting way to live. It is the most, can I use a, another word? Fun. People ask me, how are you doing? I am having fun. I have fun serving Jesus. I have fun seeking his face. I have fun reading the scriptures because I discover stuff. I have fun seeking his face because he's so wonderful. He's so thrilling. He's so amazing. You're starting to look like you're from Moldova. (laughs) No, no, it's too late. Too late now. No, 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 you can't do that. That's... Uh, you're just, you got disqualified as soon as you sat there staring at me with your arms crossed. The greater problem is that, that if you ask the vast majority who are experiencing what I just described, and, they'll, and you ask them how they're doing, and you know what they're going to say to you? I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. Doing all right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everything's, everything's okay. No, it's not Okay. It's not okay to live that way, and we're going to deal with it tonight, and we're going to change tonight, and we're going to be different tonight, and God is going to transform our hearts and our minds and our spirit and our soul and our body in this very room tonight so that at the start of Summer Fire Conference here in 2018, you're going to start a whole new life. You're going to start a whole new way of living. You're going to start experiencing God the way he was meant to be experienced. You're going to start serving God the way he's meant to be served. You're going to start enjoying God the way he's meant to be enjoyed. 
That's from one of the very foundations of one of our creeds. It starts off by saying, we were designed to enjoy God. And, and, and he enjoys us. We have this mutual affection and kindness and heart towards one another. So it's not okay. It's, it's, it's time to sound the alarm in our own hearts. We, we have to be willing to experience the pain of a life gone wrong. Does that make sense? You have to be willing to say, this is not the way it was meant to be. You have to say, for the last three years, my marriage has been a wreck, but we're just going through the motions. We see each other, give a little peck on each other's cheek and say, how you doing? Had a good day? And then you ignore each other all week long. That's not a healthy marriage. It's time to say to yourself, I don't have a healthy marriage and something has to change. I... The way, the way we're living our lives, the way we're, look, the way we're raising our children, the things we're tolerating, just that slow drip. You've heard it. I won't take the time to explain it, but the frog in the kettle. Just turn up the heat, and, 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 and that's what we're doing. We're like a frog in the kettle that he didn't jump out because the heat was raised so slow that, that you didn't experience it. You didn't even realize how hot it was. And so there's many of us in this room here right now that you're, you know that you're experiencing life, but you're in denial. You're not accepting the reality of that something's wrong. So, and, and tonight I pray the Holy Spirit provoke you. I pray the Holy Spirit convict us and get us to the place where we're willing to say, you know what, I'm going to admit it. Something's not right, and I want to see it changed. Until, until we get to that place of saying, I, I want things to change, then we're not going to see the change. And that's why 50% of marriages are ending in divorce in our society today because we tolerate it for so long and ask each other how we're doing and we say we're fine and we think our marriages are fine and then it gets too late and things are ruined and 50% of marriages end in divorce. 80% of young people today are considered addicted to video games and uh, cellular devices and social media. Eight out of ten of our children today are addicted uh, based on the same kind of addiction uh, research that you would do for a drug addict. It's, 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 it's incredible. Seventy percent, uh, now I'm going to start stepping on your toes, okay? Uh, if, if you thought I've offended you already, just hold on to your seats here a little bit. Seventy percent of people, including Christians, are either overweight or obese. And, and, and we're saying to ourselves, well, I'm going to start a diet, uh, but, but we never do. Why? Because, well, we're fine. It's not that bad. And so, 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 okay, so you may say, well, it's not that bad, and maybe it's not. But for me, uh, when, when I put on pounds, which I often do, I end up, I don't know about you, but I get sluggish. Anybody get sluggish when you're just like, you eat a little too much? How many of you eaten, overeaten at a meal? There's a word for that in the Bible. It's not called baloney. It's called gluttony. When I overeat in meals, I get sluggish, and, and no matter how much I pray, God, raise me up. God, stir my heart. God, fill me with passions. If I eat like a pig all day long, seven days a week, 12 months out of the year, I can pray all I want about God's favor and God's grace and God's energy and passion for Jesus, but when I get home from work, I'm going to lay down on that couch with a remote control and a bag of chips and crisp. Why? Because I'm already going to be burned out. I'm already going to be slothful. I'm already going to be lacking of energy. I'm already my, I'm going to have brain fog. And some of you are saying, go on to the next point, Gary. You're stopping here at overweight. Don't do that. But, but, but this is a biblical issue that we don't talk about in the church. Um, lack of physical fitness. If you don't move, you're going to eventually have to have somebody move you. Probably in a wheelchair. We have to get, get up and move. I was going to preach a sermon at the last pastor's conference I had. I had a great title for it. It's called Fat Pastors. <laughs> or... Or pastors and push-ups. And I was one of them. I wanted them, I wanted them to, let, let's all just stop the conference right now and get on the floor and see how many of us can do one push-up. Because, I'll go, okay, I'll quit, I'll quit hassling you. But, but, but this body is a temple. And, 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 
and we can want things, and we can want God to do miracles and new things and create passion in our life, but if we disobey him in some arenas in our life, we're not going to have that passion. I believe, and I love how Pastor studies the new covenant and proclaims it to this nation, but there are a few things, I hope he doesn't disagree with me, there are a few things that the new covenant can't do. Ooh, that sounds dangerous, doesn't it? There are a few things that the New Covenant cannot do. It cannot take calories out of a three-scoop ice cream fudge, brownie, sprinkles, whipped cream. The New Covenant does not remove calories from our fat eating. Somebody should say amen there and make me feel a little bit better. He, he, he doesn't, it, do, it doesn't happen. There are a few, that's, and that's about the only thing I know that the New Covenant doesn't do. Everything else, it, it's Christ's finished work. But there are some things that he's saying, no, you have to get to the point where you're dissatisfied, where you're uncomfortable, where you're saying, no, this has got to change because I need energy, because I need passion, because I need zeal, because I need the fire of the Lord. And if my body is not in the condition that the Lord wants it to be, then things go south. Uh, as I started pursuing this in my own life, I started feeling guilty like, I don't know, I guess raised in the kind of circumstances or church or situation I was in, anything that didn't have to do with sort of like, um, you know, or how much did you pray today or how much did you read your Bible? For, I kind of grew up in an environment where if you thought about how you ate or physical fitness or exercising, it was considered like, oh, you're getting worldly, you're, you're getting, and, and I started feeling guilty just even a few weeks ago because I was spending about maybe like an hour a day just exercising, and, and I started feeling guilty, and, and I said, Lord, you know, if, if this is carnal, if this is fleshly, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm, you know, prioritizing this and losing out on following after you, then, then correct me, and I just, very rarely as I, I, I do it this way, but I just opened up my scriptures, and it was, and it was Proverbs chapter 12, and it said, the strength of, a, it takes the, a strong ox to accomplish the harvest, and I went, wow, God wants you to be strong. He wants you to be healthy. He wants your mind clear. He wants your arteries clear. He, he wants you to, to live in a life that not only pleases him but gives you energy. 30% of Americans, some of it has to do with lack of exercise and, and eating improperly, but 30% of Americans are right now on antidepressants because they're so depressed. I would imagine it's maybe a little less here, but you might have the same kind of struggles. You might wish you had more access to it. Right now, there are 200, or excuse me, 20,000 Americans who are, excuse me, 20,000 Americans who are dying every year of opiate addictions. There are 28, Amer American, 28 million Americans who are, who are using substance. They're in substance abuse right now. A large number here in Ireland as well, right? Uh, these are things... What's happening? Why? What, what's, what's underneath that? What's the root? Does is, is just 28 million Americans just say, I kind of think I want to be on drugs? No. They're saying, I'm miserable. I'm unhappy. Uh, I'm, I'm missing something. The problem is not just that, but many people who come into the church as well are, are some of those people of the 28 that are on drugs. Million. Some of them are in our churches that are using the antidepressants. And I'm not talking bad about medicines if, if the if a prescription is necessary in your life. I'm, I'm not speaking to that directly here, but I'm saying there comes a time where we have to face the underlying issue and say, God, what is it in my life that's happening? Why are these things happening in my life? So, so my conviction is we are in great need. My conviction is we are ignoring the need that we have my conviction, thirdly, then, is if we're ignoring the need that we have, it will never get better. We'll never change until we face the reality. But my fourth conviction is very simple as well, but, but so much better. So far, I've been sort of making you feel like, wow, we're, we're off to a very depressing start here at Summer Fire. I wasn't depressed until you started preaching. <laughs> but I have some good news for you. I have some good, because it's also my conviction that God is good. Yeah. My conviction is that God is love, that God knows you. He designed you. He created you. And my conviction is that God has a purpose and a plan and a destiny for your life. It is my knowledge of God. I know God in such a way as to know he's out for your good and not for your harm. My, my knowledge of God 
convicts me and convinces me that today he's wanting to do something to create in you a new joy, a new freshness, a new vigor, a new vitality, a new hope, a new sense of destiny, a new sense of calling, a new sense of purpose, a new sense of um, uh, my life is meaningful and it counts. It's worth living and, and God has something good for me. God is on my side. Ephesians 3.20 says this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Now, this is really interesting. He's able to do more than, what is the word there? More than all. So that, that's a strange phrase, isn't it? How does somebody do more than all? Because all is complete, right? All is all. There's, once you have all, there's no more than all. Like a football team won all their games, but they won more than all their games. How do you do that? <coughs> I, don't, I don't understand, but God has a math that is beyond our math. Did you know that? He is able to do more than all we ask or imagine. I don't know about you, but I have an amazing imagination. Anybody here have a good imagination? I mean, like I grew up with a wild, crazy imagination. I grew up in New York, and and basketball was real popular there. And so I would imagine that I was on the New York Knicks basketball team. And I would imagine, and I, and I went out in my backyard, and I had a basketball goal there, and, and I, would, I would play the whole game. And Gary Wilkerson walks down the court, and he's got the ball. There's three seconds left in the game. He shoots. There's five guys guarding him. He's falling over backwards. Six people have karate chopped him, but he throws the ball up, and it goes through the hoop, and they win the game. Ah, the crowd goes wild. They're clapping like they're not from Moldova. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's just like, so my imagination is, and then, then when I became, got involved in the ministry, my imagination didn't quit. It was like, um, you know, on the cover of Charisma magazine, they have just decided to write an article about this young pastor who has reached more people than Billy Graham has ever reached, and he's only 20 years old. Ah, the crowd goes wild. <laughs> he's on the cover of Charisma. You know, and so, so I had this amazing imagination, and then I read this, and it says he's able to do more than we even imagine. Now, some of the more he has to do is imagine and get some of the fleshly carnal desires out of our heart. In the first place, to be on the cover of a magazine is not godly ambition anyway, so some of the things that he does to help us uh, more than we imagine is correct us and challenge us and change us and, and move our, our goals and get us to be not so carnal and fleshly, but to get us to be spiritually minded like Christ. But that's more. And so many of us, our expectations for what God is going to do is less than he is expecting or desiring to do in our life or is going to do in our life. Hold on to your seat because God is about to do something good in your life. And my expectation is that you're not going to be stuck in that life of doldrums and, and couch potatoism and, and living in front of the television. You're going to have such an exciting life filled with love for your family, filled with love for your children, filled with love for your neighbors, filled with love for your church, filled with love for your friends, filled with love for the word, filled with love for prayer that your life will be so thrilling that you won't have time to do the things that are unimportant and meaningless in life. You will find, I believe you're going to find a meaningful life, a purposeful life, a life full of destiny. And I want to ask you the question then is how do we begin to experience this kind of life? So turn with me to one other scripture if you would, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, it's a passage of scripture, almost everybody in this room knows, knows it quite well. What's it say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else or all these things shall be added unto you. So, okay. Now, let's put that in the context of everything I've just said. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. But what I was talking about today was a miserable life, a discouraged life, a downcast life, a life of of overeating and, and uh, oversleeping and, and lack of exercise and maybe some addictions and, 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 and marriages that are struggling. And I was talking about all that. And now we come to this text, one of the most primary important things Jesus ever said is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. When I was, began to study the scripture as a young man, I, I always read it kind of the wrong way. I, I always read it sort of seek only, for, seek only, not just seek first, but seek only the kingdom of God 
and these other things will be added unto you. But the scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, maybe, listen to this carefully, maybe it's possible there are secondary things that he allows you to seek. You see, I used to get guilty for seeking secondary things. I'd say, no, you know, I only, I, I only, I, you know, I fix my eyes on Jesus, and that's all I do. I just pray, and I, and I fast, and I read, and I don't, I don't want secondary things. But the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God, and then these other things will be added unto you. How does he add these other things unto you? Well, one of the things he does is he begins to birth in you a desire to see some of these secondary things in your life. You see, seeking Jesus is Hands down, without question, primary focus of our life. The greatest thing you'll ever do with your life is give your whole heart to Jesus and love him deeply and passionately and say, there's nothing in my life that that counts and there's nothing in my life that compares and there's nothing in my life that I want more. I want Jesus. I want him in the morning. I want him in the afternoon. I want him in the evening. I want to dream about him when I'm sleeping. I want to call out his name in the middle. Instead of snoring and waking my wife up, I'd like to go like, Jesus, Jesus. I'd like to just talk about him when I'm awake, talk about him when I'm asleep, talk about him when I'm on an airplane, talk about him when I'm in a car, talk about him when... I just, I just, I, I want Jesus first, and we, that's what a follower of Jesus, because he's won our heart, he's won our affection, but, but what happens is, the enemy comes in, and he sows these very subtle seeds, tares among the wheat, he sows these thoughts into our mind as, is, uh-oh, you started seeking something besides Jesus, you started seeking a good marriage, and, and, and and we begin to, like, I rebuke that thought in the name of Jesus. No, don't rebuke that thought. Seek a happy marriage. It's not seeking it first. You're seeking Jesus first. If you put your marriage ahead of Jesus, then you're not listening to the scripture of seeking him first. But if you don't seek a good marriage, you're missing out on all the other things he wants to give to you. And all the other things he wants to give to you, the first thing he gives to you is desire to get those things. And so we're actually rebuking the very thing that Jesus wants us to do. So Jesus is saying, you want thriving children. And I, and I go to myself, yes, Jesus, I'm praying for my children. Oh, I better not pray for my children because that's seeking something other than the kingdom of God. And I'm a man of God and all that. You know, and, I, I just, and have you heard this phrase before? To seek his face, not his hand. I am personally, I don't know about you, but I'm personally glad my children, when they were growing up, didn't just seek my face, but they sought my hand too. You know, they didn't just say, Dad, all we're doing is just seeking your face. We want to know you. We, want, we, want to, we just want to adore you. We just want to be affectionate towards you. We, we don't want you to take us to school. We don't want you to, to teach us math. We don't want you to play ball with us. We, we, don't, we, we don't want you to discipline us because that's your hand. We don't want your hand. We just want your face. No, God is just like we are as fathers, except obviously uh, not different as well. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. It's, it's like God wants us to not be so super spiritual, so to speak, to say, all I'm seeking is your face. And he's going, well, I got two hands. If you want to use them, we could get some good stuff done. We might could get rid of some of that depression if you start seeking me to do that. We might get rid of the, some of that discouragement, that despondency, that despair, that laziness, that slothfulness, that gluttony. We might, could, we might could deal with some addictions. We might could deal with some things in your heart that we could change if you'll seek my hand as well. Seek it secondly, but seek it. That's why I'm saying the secondary seeking of significant secondaries because there are a lot of secondary things that are very significant in your life, right? Somebody give me an amen if you would. There are a lot of things in your life that are significant even though they might be secondary. But just because they're secondary doesn't mean that they're not vitally important in your life. Your marriage is important to God. Your children are important to God. I have some friends who I I asked them recently, it's like, what is it that you really want? And, and, and they, they comment to me, it's like, they, that they're learning, and I love this, they were seeking God first, and they're kind of growing to the place where their, their wants are not as important to them as they once were. And, I, and the question I asked them was, like, it says, it sounds like you want anything. Do you want your children to thrive and serve Jesus and to love them? And they said, yeah, I want that. And, and the gentleman I was talking to is, is, is like this amazing writer and, and he's launching a project now to make a major motion picture release in Hollywood. And, 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 and I was thinking, man, that guy, he's doing those great things, those skills, that vision, that passion that he has. He's doing those things. Why? Because there's something that God put in his heart. There's, there's a want. There's a desire. There's a passion. Here's what I'm trying to tell you is don't 
don't allow the enemy to make you feel guilty for things that you want. Now, you might be saying, but, but sometimes I want the wrong thing. Well, that's simple. Just read your Bible every day, and it will tell you what's wrong and what's right. And can I just simply say, want the things that are right and don't want the things that are wrong. Can I get any simpler than that? So when you read something that says, you know, don't covet uh, your neighbor's property, okay? I won't want to do that. Don't, don't lust after your neighbor's wife. Okay, I won't do that. But when it says something like uh, pursue righteousness and godliness, okay, I'm going to do that. When, when it says bodily exercise profits, profits a little bit, okay, I'll do that. I'm going to do, I want to want the things that he wants me to want. And as I read the scripture, I get discernment. I get understanding. I get wisdom. And I begin to say, and it begins to get into my heart, right? And we begin to say to God, yeah, when I read this, something leaps in my heart. I'm starting to want what you want me to want. I'm starting to get frustrated over living the lives that you don't want me to want. I'm starting to not tolerate it anymore. I'm starting to seek not only your face, but your hand to move in my life to create dramatic change because I'm telling you, it is not sinful to want things. God wants you to want things as long as the priority is secondary. When I was uh, probably eight or nine years old, um, I was reading a comic book. Do you call them comic books here? In, in our, like, I was reading a comic book, and on the last page of the comic book, there was this, I think it was like a 200 or 300-piece army set, and it had, uh, during the American Civil War, we had the North that wore blue uniforms and the South that wore gray uniforms. And so this was a Civil War army set, and it had about 100 soldiers with guns, uh, all in blue, and about 100 that were in gray, and they had the guns and bayonets, and some of them had swords, and some of them were on cavalry horses, and they were charging, and there were, and there were uh, cannons that had these wheels, and you could roll them, and then it had a, uh, this thing you rolled out and put it on your, like your dining room table, and it was like the size of, of a whole dining room table, and you could set up your whole battle on this thing. Well, my father had just gotten home from a long trip, and he was laying, he was laying in a lounge chair, one of those folding chairs, like getting some sun out in the backyard, and, and I saw this comic book, and I'm going, I'm going, oh, I'm getting this thing. This is, to oh, man, I can't wait to get this. Now, if you know anything about my dad, he was the most kind man, compassionate, and super generous. He just, like, if he had anything in his pocket that was monetary, he just like, here, take that. I don't want it in my pocket. You take it. He was just giving and giving and giving, and he never once, my whole life, ever raised his voice at me. Isn't that amazing? He, he corrected me. He spanked me. He disciplined me, but he never got angry, never raised his voice. The closest he ever got to it was my taking this comic book out to him in the backyard and showing it to him. He said, Dad, look at this amazing army set. I want you to buy this for me. And I'll never forget his reaction. He goes, son, I've given you everything you've ever needed. I, 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 I break my back to provide for my family, and you come out here, and you're asking me for this junk, for this trinkets. No, I'm not getting you that. Go back inside. And I went like, wow. I, I'm not used, to, you know. Now, if you were used to your dad acting like that every day, it would probably be common for you, but it was such a shock to me and so surprising. I went back in, and I was like fighting back tears. I was like, not because I didn't get that, but I felt like I had offended my father or disappointed him or asked for something I shouldn't have asked for or wanted for something. Oh, I must be, and, and, it, and, it, and it immediately started me saying this. I remember as a child starting to say, I shouldn't want things. I should just be satisfied with what happens to me. You know, just sort of just take life as it unfolds and just accept it and don't, don't ask for too much or don't ask for anything. And so I started feeling like that for a couple of weeks until one day uh, my dad came in and he had this big box and it, it was the postal office had just delivered it at our house and it, had, it was wrapped in the, in the that brown uh, kind of envelope paper and it had wrapping around it and it had my name on it. It said Gary Wilkerson. I had never even gotten a letter in my whole life, let alone a big package from the post office. And, and he brought it in and he goes, hey, this came in the mail for you. And I went, wow, that's incredible. Now I had forgotten about the army set, but I ripped open that newspaper and you can guess what it was. It was that army set. And he op I remember, I'll never forget, he opened it up with me, and we laid it out on the table, and he said, I'll be the South. And I went, yay. <laughs> and, and I'll be the good guys in the North. And, and I, I'll never forget, like, my cavalry started attacking his, his flank. Like, oh, I'm surprising you. I'm coming around the outside. And I remember him taking his soldiers going, like, oh, I'm running. Your army's too strong for me. And he ran away, and I went, like, victory, yay. And the crowd's going, wild. No. Uh, <laughs> and... and, and <laughs> And so, 
And I learned something about the Father heart of God then, that, that he wants you to want, he loves for you to ask, and he loves to give you thanks. Again, you can bring discernment to that through understanding the scripture, but once you understand his heart, you begin to ask, and he delights in giving to you. Why don't you have, he says, because you don't ask me. I want you to ask me. I want you to think of things you want. You want your marriage to change. Ask me. You want the addictions to break off. Ask me right now. Ask me to put a passion for life inside of you. Ask me to give you a vision like my friend has a vision about making movies. Ask me. Ask me. And I, and I delight to do these things. See, we have this image of God that he's, he, he's just sort of like all he wants is, is super spirituality. Like, uh, God, I, I want my marriage to be to be healthy and vibrant. Stop asking me kind of things like that. I, you know, I saved you, didn't I? You know, Jesus already died for you. Asking for more stuff already? No, he's not like that, is he? He, he even says, if, if he didn't withhold his own son from you, uh, would he withhold other things, other good things? He's a good, good father who loves to give good gifts. And if you ask him for a fish, will he give you a scorpion? If you ask him for bread, will he give you a stone? I would say the opposite is true as well. If you ask him for a scorpion, will he give it to you? No, he'll, he'll give you fish. If you ask him for a stone, he'll give you bread. He is always thinking about your best interest. He's always trying to provoke and, and promote in you a desire to, number one, seek his face, like we're reading in Matthew, but number two, follow that up by saying, God, thank you. You're so good to me. You're so precious to me. You're allowing me to ask you for things that I don't deserve, that I could never earn, but you're asking, but I'm asking you to let me be free and let me live a life of victory, and let me live a life of spiritual disciplines, and let me live a life of overcoming the enemy, and let me live a, a life full of a wonderful marriage, and, and I pray, and I ask you every day that my four children would, would thrive in the Lord and be passionate about Jesus, and I ask him to protect my grandchildren, keep them safe from the enemy every single day. I pray that, and never once does God say, oh, I'm so tired of you asking me stuff. Stop and just get spiritual. God says that is spiritual. When you walk with me and when you talk with me and when we're friends and when, you, and when you express your heart to me and when you confess there's problems and there's difficulties and there's trials and there's struggles and things that aren't correct in your life, when you talk to me about those things, I desire to bring change. I desire to bring life transformation. I desire to allow things that God is doing to, be, to bring great change, great value into our life. Ephesians 3.20 that we read before, if I could just read it to you one more time, but this time from the message translation, not my favorite translation, but just it's worth reading this. It says, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine, guess, or request in your wildest dreams. I like that. What is your wildest dream? And if it's scriptural, and if it's God-honoring, he wants you to ask him. He wants you to ask, God, I, I have a, an aspiration. Some of you young people in here, you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or, or you want to be a writer or an artist, but you're thinking to yourself, oh, I, guess, I guess I have to be a preacher. I guess I have to be more spiritual. I guess maybe I have to be an intercessor. Or maybe Preach and be an intercessor, but if you want to be a lawyer, be a lawyer. Because God gives you the desires of your heart. He put that within you. And it's a noble cause. If you want if you want to, I don't know, something stupid like pray cricket the rest of your life. You know, do that. Do, you know, and if you get paid for it, at least anyway. Some of your some of your parents are going like, no, 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 don't tell my son that. <laughs> and and God wants to, to do that. Now, it's all within the realm of realism. If you're, if you're five foot tall and you weigh 300 pounds, don't strive to be an NBA basketball player, okay, because you're not going to get there. But there are things that God, he, how he built you, how he created you, how he designed you, and there's a natural fit for the greatest expression of that natural fit for you to do something with your life that matters, that counts, that's alive, that's vibrant. And so I have, I'm going to close with this, but I have four major desires in my life, four things that I want desperately that are secondary issues. The first one is to love Jesus. Man, just absolutely, totally, always just fire zeal for God, for just, just Jesus. But there's a few things that, there's four areas of my life 
And, and, and I, I just want to share them with you because maybe some of you might want to adopt these. One is I want to live such a vibrant life, but not for myself. I want to live to bless other people. So I want my life to matter, to be significant, to be worth living, to be worthwhile, not for what I do for myself, but what I do for the benefit of others. So I want to live a life that is of benefit and blessing to other people. That's something I want, and that's something I pray about every day. God, I want that. I want today. I don't want just generally sort of, you know, over the next sort of cosmically over the next few years to, to live as a benefit for others, but I want to wake up every morning and say, I want this day to live for something bigger than myself. I want to live today for something that is a bigger story than my story of, uh, you know, I want to exercise or I want to lose a little weight or I want, to, I want to be happy today. I want to live for something bigger than that. So when that's my drive and my passion and my want and I offer that to Jesus, when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like pushing the snooze button anymore. I feel like, thank God it's Monday. I get, up to, I get to wake up today and say, I get to live for something bigger than myself. I get to live for the benefit of others. Secondly, I say to myself, uh, I, I want to live with such passionate love for my family and for other people that it changes their life. I want to live for others, but I want to love them so deeply that their lives are changed. Because this is a world, all those problems that I described when I started this message are born out of people hungry for love, looking for it in all the wrong places, looking for it in addictions and food and, and, and even the television to, to escape from the problems and, and for somebody to be loved. And if we as Christians would begin to say, I want to wake up every morning and just love people deeply. I want to live for others and live for something bigger than myself and I want to love greatly. Number three, I would say to ourselves, give extravagantly, in, uh, give an extravagant generosity. Just give your life away. Just give, if, if you start giving, you're going to live the most exciting life there is possible. Stingy people are always miserable. Selfish people are always depressed. They always are. They, and, and, and you won't have to give your money to a psychiatrist if you give it to people around you that you're pouring out your love to. Because there's something about generosity that creates joy. Not at first. When you have that 10 euros in your pocket and you see somebody in need and you go like, man, that's the last 10 euros and I was going to buy that, you know, that fish and chips. I was, and, 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 but then, and you don't want to, but then when you do, you go like, what do you do? Oh, that felt good, didn't it? That felt nice. It'd be nicer if they used that 10 euros to buy me some fish and chips, maybe. But, <laughs> but, but giving, the living that life of generosity and giving, giving is, is, is a way. And the fourth one is growing. I want to grow daily in discipline. I want to grow daily in health, spirit, soul, and body, as First Corinthians, excuse me, First Thessalonians chapter 5 says. He, he wants us to be whole in spirit soul, and body. Most of us as Christians feel like there's only one word that Jesus is interested in, their spirit. But he wants us to be whole and holy in our soul as well. Most people that study this describe the soul as being your will, your intellect or emo uh, and mind, and your emotions. He wants you to be emotionally healthy. He wants your will to be strong. In other words, you say, I'm going to do this, and you actually are disciplined to do that. That's something that God wants from your heart. He wants you to be healthy and whole, spirit, soul, and body. And so there's this, this thing of, of I, I want to grow in all those realms so that every day I am growing in discipline, I'm growing in wisdom, I am growing in, and the last thing I say is, I'm growing in success, all right? So now you're looking at me saying like, oh, man. We didn't know we invited a faith and prosperity preacher here. We would have, we, yeah, that's right, we didn't, we didn't. So when you hear me say success, you're going like, wait a minute, are you a pop psychologist? Are you a, are you a prosperity preacher? Are you talking about success? Well, here's my question to you. If you're saying like, hey, don't talk about success, what would you rather have, mediocrity? If you're saying to yourself, hey, I, I don't want to be successful, are you saying, well, I want to be a failure? I want to be successful in loving Jesus with all my heart. 
I want to be successful in loving that woman there to where she just realizes, like, I cannot believe it. I feel like I'm the most loved woman in the world. He, he just... See, he just is constantly barraging me with compliments and flowers and cooks meals for me and makes the bed uh, once a year for me. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, I just, just shower her with affection and adoration and love. I, I want that. I want to be successful in that. I want to be a successful father. I, I don't want to be mediocre as a father. I want to be successful. I want to study the scripture successfully. I don't want to read it in like... And if you read the scripture and you read a chapter, when you're done reading it, you go like, I, I don't remember what I just read. I forgot it already. I, I want to be successful. And so, so I pray, God, help me to grow every single day. If you'll do those four things, you'll, you, it'll be impossible for you to live the kind of life that's depressed, discouraged, despondent, in despair. If, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, but also allow God to allow you to seek his hand, to begin to move in the areas of life being abundant, love being full, giving being extremely generous, and, and what's the fourth one? I forgot. Uh, get growing every single, it's bad when you forget your own four <laughs> values in life. You know, it's like memory is my fifth value. I, I want to remember the first four as I get older now growing every single day. You'll be excited about life. You'll be excited about Jesus. You'll be passionate about your friendships. You'll be passionate about where you go about, what you do every day, your career, your vocation, your calling, your spiritual life, your soul life, and your body life. You'll be excited about it because you'll be excited about Jesus because you're seeking first the kingdom of God. You're seeking his hand and his face, and you're seeing God fulfill his promises of giving you an abundant life and doing far more above and beyond abundantly what you think or ask or even imagine. How many of you have a good imagination? Just wave at me right now, and you want to say, God, all right now, I want to imagine me facing my problems straight on, me saying, God, I'm going to ask you to make a covenant with me in, a, in the sense of working things out in my life and, and helping me just enter into it and see things change by your grace. I'm going to ask you today to take what is miserable and make it amazing, to take what is depressing and make it exciting, to take what is causing me almost to want to escape from life and make me want to live my life. God, let there be tonight a transition in my life. Amen. If you need that, if you want that, if you're ready for that, why don't you stand with me? And just say, I need that. I want that. I want more of that. Some of you might say, I want more of it. I want, I want to, I want to see a change. I want to see a transformation. I want to see something significant take place. If you would, while we begin to pray, just think of that one thing. When I was talking about at the beginning of my sermon, some are discouraged or depressed or downcast, troubled about children, troubled about marriage. Think about that for just a moment. Say, God, right now, whatever that is. Just whether it's quietly or out loud, just say, God, right now, I want you to change my fill in the blank. God, I want you to change my marriage. God, I want you to change my financial situation. God, I want you to change my physical health. God, I want you to change my son, my daughter. God, I want you to change my prayer life. God, I want you to change, get rid of this disappointment and discouragement, this fear that overwhelms me. God, I want that to change, and I, and I want to ask you now, we have not because we ask not, so I'm asking you, God, to take out those things that don't belong. Oh, but God, I thank you that you don't just get rid of the stuff that doesn't belong in our heart. Oh, you're so above and beyond all that we think or imagine. What you do in this place is give us something that's even greater. You give us joy unspeakable and full of glory. You give us life, and not just life, but life abundant. You give us healthy marriage and healthy children, healthy homes, godly families. God, you meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. God, we don't have to, to fear, to strive, to stress. You're going to provide. I am praying right now in the name of Jesus for those who are severely in debt right now. You are so in debt, you can't hardly sleep at night. I pray in the name of Jesus, not only that there would be miracles take place, financial miracles, but Lord, there, you would build in them vision and discipline and wisdom, God, of how to live an ordered life. So we pray for that right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm just going to step on toes again, but I'm going to pray for, Lord, Lord, how we are in our fitness and our food. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that, that we'd not just say, I'm going to do it or I'm thinking about doing it, but God, you, we would honor you even in our bodies. 
we, we would say, Lord, there's not condemnation here. There's not looking around saying, oh, that, yeah, that person needs this prayer. <laughs> Lord, it's, it's, it's just simply, God, we all need it. We all need to, to, to honor you, God, and, and give us the Holy Ghost gumption to say, even that is important to you because it's important to me. And God, people are not going to start new diets because of this sermon. They're going to start just living healthy. They're going to start saying, yes, I can. They're going to start believing instead of not facing it head on. I thank you, God. I pray for husbands that are ignoring their wives. They're so busy in their careers that right now, in the name of Jesus, they would face that problem head on and saying, I want to, I want to start. Some of you husbands are wondering, like, why doesn't my wife respect me? Why doesn't she, why doesn't she move towards me with grace and affection? Well, if you'll start showering her, if you would take for the next three months and every single day wake up and say, I'm going to give her a, 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 a note, I'm going to put my hand on her shoulder and pray for her today, as soon as I get home from work, I'm going to ask her how was her day and I'm going to listen. If you'll do that, you're going to have the most affectionate, passionate, loving wife you'd ever want in your life, unless she's crazy. So in the name of Jesus, and you can heal that too, Lord, but in the name of Jesus, I pray for husbands and wives, spouses here, God. That, that this conference would be something that would ignite the flame again in their, in their marriage, ignite it again in their marriage. Father, for those who have lost passion for their life, in other words, they have no drive, they have no spiritual ambition, they have no godly ambition, they don't want anything. Lord, put a want in their heart. Put a want, Lord. Make them say, you know what, I want, I want my career to look like this. I, want, I, want, I have a vision to start this business or this career, or I have a vision to go back to school or finish college, or I have a vision to, to, to work in this field, or I have a vision to, to, to serve the children in my church, or I have a vision to, to, to teach people how to, how, to, how to read in a second language, or whatever it might be, God, put vision and, and compelling interest and passions in our heart. Thank you, God, and I thank you in closing that you don't mind us seeking secondary things because they're still significant to us and they're significant to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless.